Hi, and welcome to our 11 a.m. press conference, Medio Tsunamis, an overlooked hazard for the Great Lakes and beyond. Our speakers this morning are Eric Anderson, the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Greg Dusick from the Na NOAA National Ocean Service in Silver Spring, Maryland, Philip Chu at the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And on the phone, we have Chin Wu from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who will be available during the question and answer session. OK, thank you. Uh, so media tsunamis are probably a term that is unfamiliar to most people. Um, but it, at least in part, uh, but they're not that different from the more commonly referred to seismic tsunami. So seismic tsunamis are driven by an earthquake, say off in the ocean that produces a wave. Meteor tsunamis uh, are similar on the wave side, but instead of being produced by an earthquake, they're produced by a weather system, a storm. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, so the wave character characteristics between meteor tsunamis and tsunamis Again, very similar. Uh, these are long waves. They propagate away from the source, so whatever creates them. Uh, their wavelengths are on the scale of, of kilometers. Wave heights can be up to a couple meters at the shoreline. Uh, their periods are, are more high frequency type oscillations, so they're between two minutes and two hours. So very similar between meteor tsunamis and the more commonly known tsunami. Um, in fact, we think meteor tsunamis make up about 10% of the world's known tsunami events. And that number could even be higher uh, because these are so hard to detect. Uh, but I think the first thing to do is forget the, the, the Hollywood movie poster image of a tsunami wave hitting the coast and think of something more along the lines of a rapid flood uh, and then retreat of water associated with that wave. And along with that comes dangerous currents, flooding, uh, property damage, inundation, things like that. So uh, the meteor tsunami itself, instead of being driven by an earthquake, I said it's driven by a weather system. So in this case, the best thing to picture is just a thunderstorm, a, you know, a squall line type of uh, imagery. You can see here uh, radar reflectivity of an event over Lake Michigan that happened in 2003, or an image of one over Lake Michigan uh, from just a couple of years ago. So these thunderstorms uh, tend to drive about 80% of the meteor tsunamis that, that, that we see uh, with them See if this goes. There we go. Uh, they are associated with basically a sharp rise uh, in wind speed uh, at the front of these storms and possibly in combination with a big change in air pressure. Uh, and these are the ingredients that we need to start making a meteor tsunami. So that storm is propagating across, in this case, uh, across the surface of the water. As it does that, it creates a wave uh, below that storm, which then begins to propagate uh, in the direction of that storm. Now, if these storm speeds, these two speeds, if the storm speed matches or is close to that wave speed, and that wave speed's dependent on how deep the water is in that area, but if those speeds match, essentially you have something called a, a resonant coupling. So those, that storm and that wave move at the same speed. The storm can then efficiently put all of its energy into that wave, and it grows that wave, makes that meteor tsunami wave become potentially destructive. And that wave can further amplify as it comes into shallow water in shoals, uh, or as it enters a harbor where there may be a special uh, additional type of resonance that can occur. And this is when these become destructive. An example is uh, from an event we have in uh, Lake Michigan that, that struck Chicago uh, in 1954. You can see the wave being produced here as it moves across Lake Michigan. Uh, then these waves can refract or reflect off of coastlines. Uh, they can make edge waves that travel along shorelines as well. And what happens when this, ha when this occurs is that wave can become decoupled or disassociated with that storm. So you no longer have that trigger of recognizing dangerous conditions when you look up into the sky. You may see calm conditions instead of seeing that thunderstorm, and all of a sudden this wave comes out of nowhere. And that's what happened in 1954. Uh, a wave struck Chicago, uh, a meteor tsunami wave with large fluctuations in water level and resulted in 10 fatalities. And it was about four hours after that storm came by. So it was a calm, sunny period, and a wave comes out of nowhere. And this is where they're particularly dangerous. Now, that's an event from the 1950s. Most of our information, at least in the Great Lakes, comes from looking at the historical record, media reports, uh, and other sources, eyewitness reports, uh, the Coast Guard, on these types of events that are most often misidentified. So they, they're, call, they're called uh, seiches in the lakes or uh, tidal waves at times. Uh, we see these in, evidence of these in all the Great Lakes, so they seem to impact uh, each of the lakes. Uh, 
Uh, it, there are known hot spots in Lake Erie and Lake Michigan, and I'll get into other areas uh, around the world in a second. Um, and all of them, they had the potential to be destructive. So they're rare, but they're very risky. So there's been several fatalities uh, through the historical record, uh, capsized boats, property damage as a result of these me meteor tsunami waves. Uh, and in fact, uh, some recent research being presented here this week at Ocean Sciences by uh, Alvaro Linares from University of Wisconsin will detail how these connect potentially, at least in the Great Lakes, to rip current events, uh, which is an important point. We see about 12 rip current deaths per year in the Great Lakes, and we're starting to see a connection where meteor tsunamis may actually be the driver behind why these form. Now, uh, beyond the historical record, we can also use water level gauges to determine when these things tend to occur, how frequent they are. Uh, from that information, we see that, again, these follow this thunderstorm season, and in the Great Lakes, that's uh, late spring, early summer, so this kind of peaks around May, June, we see most of our events. Uh, now, statistically, these occur about 100 times per year in the Great Lakes, and that seems like a large number, but I'll say that most of these are imperceptible. They're very small, you can't even really measure them other than without a water level gauge. However, destructive events tend to occur about once every 10 years, at least in the Great Lakes. Uh, so most recently, in 2003, we had an event that killed seven swimmers in Lake Michigan. Uh, and then we've had non-fatal but destructive events in 2012, 2014, and 2017. So uh, somewhat of a frequent occurrence, even if they're poorly detected. Now, some of that information does vary depending on where you're at. So the Great Lakes may see some different timing in drivers in, say, other parts of the world. And this is really a global phenomenon. Uh, and, and part of the session we had this week is bringing together this international group of researchers that have looked into this stuff, in some cases, for a long time. In the Adriatic, they've been looking into meteor tsunamis for a few decades, actually. And so some of the research presented here will talk about digging into these historic events, classifying them, understanding what drove them, and also working towards a forecast system. And with that, I'll hand it off to uh, my colleague, Greg Dusek. <coughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about meteor tsunami events on the Atlantic coast or the U.S. East Coast. And, and I think the best way to get into this is with an example. So I'm going to take you back to June 13th of 2013, when at 2.30 in the afternoon, there was a group of divers, spear fishermen, in Barnegat Inlet, New Jersey, next to a breakwater. And then suddenly they said they found themselves picked up by a large wave and pushed over the breakwater out to the open ocean. Then tens of minutes later, they said they were picked back up by another wave, put back over the breakwater into the inlet. And then nearby, at a jetty, there were onlookers who said that a maybe six-foot wave struck the jetty and knocked multiple people into the water. And then at 3 p.m. on that same day in Falmouth Harbor, Massachusetts, residents there say they saw a surge of water exit the har harbor similar to what you might see uh, with a tsunami wave. Uh, only minutes later to see that water return, and that repeat itself several times over the next uh, several hours. And so there were reports up and down the East Coast of this anomalous wave. And there was weather associated with this event, uh, strong thunderstorm systems coming off the East Coast around New Jersey. You can see a picture of it there in the upper left. Um, and similar to what Eric mentioned before, associated with these storms was a significant air pressure drop. And this generated a meteor tsunami. And this event received a lot of attention in part because there were noticeable impacts. And so it was well studied. Uh, our office had a technical report. Uh, there were some journal articles. And there was even some numerical modeling of the event. You can see that in the bottom left there, uh, where you could use a computer model to look at how the wave propagates, similar to how you might do with a seismic tsunami, um, and as it propagated along the East Coast. Now, my office in particular is in charge of running the tide gauges, or water level gauges across the US. We have over 200 gauges operating. And these are able to observe the meteor, uh, meteor tsunami events. And to give you an example of that, I'm going to show you for this June 2013 event uh, the radar imagery, and then the corresponding times when each of our gauges observed the maximum wave height. And so you can see as the system propagates through, the, system, the gauge near Delaware Bay sees the initial disturbance. And then the wave propagates and hits the northeast around Massachusetts Providence, makes its way southward, eventually to North Carolina, and even as far as Puerto Rico. And so you can also look at this data uh, in plots, right, over time at each of the gauges. And so this shows those same 15 gauges from north to south and shows the water level data, and you can clearly see this meteor tsunami signal. Now, this data is without the tides, so we pull the tides out, we pull low frequency motions out, and you're basically left with that, that you know, two minute to two hour range that Eric mentioned where you expect to see uh, tsunami waves. And you can see, particularly in the northeast, we had several stations with over a half a meter wave, so kind of one to two feet uh, tsunami wave. 
And so this event received a lot of attention at NOAA, in part because of the impacts, and really got us focusing on, you know, how can we assess, you know, when and where these type of events occur along the East Coast to hopefully help our Weather Service colleagues be able to start understanding the hazard better and maybe even predict them. And so we developed an algorithm to look through all of our water level data up and down the East Coast and pick out meteo tsunami events. And this is completely automated without human, uh, human intervention. And so we were able to use this to look at 21 years of data uh, at over 120 gauges across the U.S. You can see there in the map and develop a climatology of when we have seen meteo tsunamis occur. And so one of the things we were surprised about were that they occurred more frequently than maybe we would have expected, and, and Eric mentioned this as well in the Great Lakes, that we set, saw over 20 events per year. Um, but the, the big thing is most of them are quite small. Over half of them were under a foot. So again, those aren't going to be things that typically cause any sort of significant impacts. What we did see is that events that get over that half a meter range, that kind of one and a half, two foot range, occur about two times a year on the East Coast. So that's similar to that June 13th case. And that's when you could start maybe seeing some noticeable impacts. In terms of when they occur, we found they were most frequent in the winter and the summer. In the winter, driven by winter storms. And in the summer, driven by strong thunderstorm systems, similar to what occurs in the Great Lakes. And then often during the afternoon and early evenings, which again is associated when we see those typical summer storm systems occur. In terms of where they occurred most frequently, you can see from the map, uh, in the Carolinas in particular, we saw a lot of events, as well as uh, in northern, kind of mid to northern Florida, and then up around Long Island Sound, uh, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. And so we're going to use this information. We want to get a report published uh, here shortly, and then, as I mentioned, work with the Weather Service so they can use this to start looking at an impact catalog and start maybe getting into prediction, and uh, that's what Philip's going to be talking about next. Okay, so Eric just showed you the science and the process of meteor tsunami. And then Greg already showed you uh, the 2013 East Coast event that detected by all the water level gauges and dark buoy. So what's next? Oh. All right, so we already know half of the answer, right? Because we could, using water level gauge to detect the meteor tsunami. But are we able to predict it? What's required? What are the key elements uh, to build this early warning system and prediction capability? Before I answer that, what I would like to show you or share with you is some of the progress we made so far. So we continue doing research on meteor tsunami, on the cause, the process, the mechanism of that uh, to better understanding the whole process. Then also with a collaboration and the hardworking researcher, scientist, faculty at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, they did the paper clip, doing the news archive, and figure out all the historical event and create the Great Lakes database on meteor tsunami. Remember, at 1952, 1929, there was no Google search and there was no internet. So they spent a lot of time creating this database and reconstruction all the historical event. The next thing is we also, at the same time, improving the weather forecast model and also hydrodynamic and wave forecasting model accuracy. So in order to predict the water level change, we need to have an accurate weather forecast model and accurate ocean uh, circulation and wave model. At the same time, we are also improving and building sensor network for better de detection. So the water level gauges, the meteorological network, on air pressure, wind speed, all the meteorological variable, all the hydrological variable, and water level information. And recently, we're coordinating with NOAA Tsunami Program Office, Tsunami Warning Center, and National Weather Service Local Forecasting Office on developing the warning protocols so we could build an infrastructure uh, to provide an early warning system. Uh, several workshops and meetings also being held uh, to do research development and protocol development on the meteor tsunami. And finally, we are leveraging advances made by Croatia scientists and international researchers uh, to collaboration and building this early warning forecasting system. So in order to build a reliable warning system, five key elements, the way I see it, five, 
Number one is we continue doing scientific research, working on the science. Number two is the data part. We continue need high frequency, real time sensor network and data, meteorological oceanographic data to give us a better means of making detection on meteor tsunami. Number three is improving all the numerical forecasting model, increasing its accuracy. So once you detect it, you need the numerical model with high, com high performance computing and supercomputer to do the forecast and making predictions. Then the, the first one is I call the infrastructure. It's establishing warning protocol to issue advisory and warning, and that's require the coordination between all NOAA line offices. Finally, remember, the NOAA's mission and goal is to saving lives and pro protecting properties. So in order to build a weather-ready nation, you know, to develop an early warning forecasting system, we got to focus on all five of those. And it's our job and NOAA's mission work on the top four, the science, the data, the model, and the protocol. But what we need from all of you, the media, the journalists, it's helping us to convey the message, education, outreach to the general public about the danger uh, and the hazard of meteor tsunami. So all five key elements, once it's all achieved, then we could build a reliable warning system. And I think that's the end of our presentation and we'll be open to questions. Great. Uh, thank you. We'll now take any questions from reporters in the room. Please uh, raise your hand and state your name and affiliation. Hi, Catherine Cornai, freelance science journalist. You mentioned that scientists in Croatia, do they yeah. have an early warning system already in place or what's the current They are developing there? and building one right now because it's people and residents in, in Croatia and Italy and Mediterranean and Adriatic Sea, they know this common very often and create a lot of hazard. So they are building the warning system right now. And as a matter of fact, we are going to hold the first international symposium of meteor tsunami workshop uh, next May in Croatia. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Hi, I'm Megan Siever with Earth Magazine. Um, I was just wondering about the wave propagation patterns, especially like seeing the one in, um, in uh, Lake Michigan. Do those follow very strict patterns in terms of, so I'm just thinking in terms of like the warning networks. Are you able to figure out like, okay, it's gonna bounce here, then here, then here, then here, or how, how does that work? Does this work? Okay. Um, so they do this. That was a computer simulation, which means that we can predict, uh, if we have enough information, we can predict the path they're going to take uh, and the interactions they might have with other waves uh, that, are, that are in the lake at that time. The difficulty is uh, having enough information. We didn't really get into the, the trouble of detecting these uh, that much in our discussion, but um, the, from the thunderstorm part, uh, we're doing a better job of, of modeling and forecasting those now than we ever have uh, in the weather service. Um, but having that level of detail in order to create a me meteor tsunami wave is still pretty difficult. And so we can go back in these historical cases and, and tune models in order to match observations. We're not quite there yet where uh, we maybe have enough uh, observational data to really create one of these in a predictive mode yet. And that's why Philip said that that's where we're going, but we're not there yet. Um, given that information, we could predict how these are going to propagate and where these move to. And so some of these, can, these historical cases you see like that Lake Michigan one, uh, you know, we probably have most of the story there, but we don't have everything yet. I think we have a question on the web chat. This question is from Kathy Kowalski, who's a freelance reporter. She asks, how much more common are these events likely to become due to climate change? So that, that's a great question. Um, I know, uh, at least in our work, since we only have 20 years of data, we haven't really been able to explore that yet with the coastal locations. Um, I don't know if Eric has anything to answer with the Great Lakes. Yeah, um, so in the Great Lakes, when these are, com these are tied to thunderstorms, 
Um, you know, some projections show the change in intensity or timing of thunderstorms. Uh, and for us, that would mean um, if that, that would change the time of year in which these might occur. Um, some other things that, that are very critical is the speed of that storm, as I mentioned, has to match that wave speed. So as characteristics like that might change, depending on time of year and, uh, and other conditions, it can change where we see them. So Lake Superior, there, for instance, there's not a lot of meteor tsunamis, uh, which is largely a function of the types of storms that get up there, the speed of storms, and also the depth of that lake. As you shift conditions um, and maybe see some faster storms, some different storms start to occur under some projections, you could start to see meteor tsunamis occur, occur more frequently up there, or uh, maybe in our case, what's more dangerous is occur more frequently during the swimming season, which is when people are in the water, right? So we think there will be changes along that line if you, if you shift when those thunderstorms occur, um, but there may be other changes too that we just uh, aren't tuned into yet. I think we have another question in the chat. Kathy has a second question. Um, so she wants to know how, uh, if you could talk a little bit about how a meteor tsunami could cause a rip current, in particular in the Great Lakes, um, and are there differences among the lakes versus, she says, you know, for example, the shallow lakes, Lake Erie versus the very deep Lake Superior. It would, which one would be more risky? And uh, so for this, if it's possible, uh, Dr. Chin Wu from University of Wisconsin-Madison is on the phone, um, who, who is, I think, better suited to answer this question. Okay. Uh. Okay. So um, the the question is being asked about in terms of the different lakes and in terms of water depths related to the rip current. So as you uh, know that um, uh, meteor tsunami is really created by the meteorology storm, and so for particular for the Lake Michigan and the Lake Erie, they are in general a little bit uh, more uh, more susceptible for this type of meteor tsunami events. And furthermore, particular for the shoreline, particular per symmetry in the Great Lakes, on the Lake Michigan and Lake Erie itself, that uh, this type of the storm event can create a uh, sort of a return current. And so in general itself, that uh, it is found that uh, the meteor tsunami, that uh, particularly in the Lake Michigan and Lake Erie, that uh, has much more higher chance to uh, cause a uh, recurrence, which showed in one of the example in the 2003, then July 4th, and uh, all of a sudden that, uh, that there are seven people drowning. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Um, Rick Lovett, uh, freelance. Um, so uh, oh, mid-ocean tsunamis propagate very quickly, um, much faster than thunderstorms. So why is it that uh, these propagate at a speed that uh, comparable to the storm? Is that the depth of the water? Yeah, so um, uh, the, that wave speed is a function of that depth. So uh, in, the, you know, in the Great Lakes, for instance, we have kind of characteristic depths near the shoreline. So if we get storms that, that uh, are going just the right speed, they can create a, a meteor tsunami wave there. On the east coast, the example that Greg showed, the same kind of condition there. And actually, in, in that one, you can see that when that wave goes over the shelf break and it gets into the deep ocean, it immediately sp uh, uh, picks up speed and accelerates. Um, and so that, that's the kind of case where the depth really is controlling that, that speed. Um, you know, a meteor tsunami over the deep ocean, uh, you're just not going to see storm speeds that produce those, which is why you see seismic activity that's producing those out there. And so it really is, is a coastal problem with these meteor tsunamis, or in our case, a, a lake problem. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any other question? Hi, Megan Siever again. Um, one of you guys mentioned that there were probably a lot more of these meteor tsunami events in history than we realize. Can you talk a little bit about how you can figure out a paleo meteor tsunami uh, deposit versus another media or another tsunami deposit versus you know storm surge or anything like that? I mean, my guess on well on the coasts because of the varying physical you know events that might have similar impacts. I think it would be very difficult uh, to do something like that. Um, I think the one thing we can rely on in the short-term past is kind of what they've done in the lakes and looking at news articles to kind of cue up when something like that has occurred. Um, there may be more possibilities in the lakes because you don't see maybe that type of event uh, as common from like storm surge or, or large waves and things like that. 
Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Are there any other questions on the chat? Oh, we have one more. I'll follow up on that question. How is this different from storm surge? That's a great question, too. Um, so st typically, your storm surge is, is, is directly driven by your winds and your pressure change, right? And it occurs over a longer duration, typically. So, you know, your surge will typically last multiple hours, you know, maybe half a day, depending on the, how fast the storm's moving, of course. Whereas with these events, the, the change in water level is mu much more abrupt, so under two hours. And typically, you're not going to get surge that occurs that quickly. Um, that all being said, there are de I think there are definitely cases in the record where you have both surge occurring and meteor tsunamis occurring at the same time, which certainly complicates both parsing those out, which is which, and trying to assess you know how much is is attributing to the change in water level. Uh, but but that's a great question. I think you know both are both are uh, can certainly contribute to things at the same time. Okay. Are there any other questions in the room? Any other questions on the chat? OK, great. Thank you very much. That concludes our press conference. Next up at 1 o'clock, the growing great Pacific garbage patch.